Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're continuing with our lesson, Prototokos Mystery. This will be part 238. Continuing Mystery of the Gathering. We are embarking on the question, why does the Lord need to gather His people? <clears throat> Scripture teaches at the coming of the Lord, He will gather the saints and reward their teachers. 2 Thessalonians, 2nd chapter, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him. So Paul lays out succinctly what will happen. The Lord will appear and then He will gather His people. The Scripture is not saying by our <coughs> being raptured to him, since he's going to gather us after he appears. <clears throat> Matthew 24, verse 46 to 47. As we're turning, do you believe that the term catching up can be described as a gathering? Yes. Because you know that this is going to be the argument against the gathering. <laughs> but it means people are reading things into the scripture. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> the, um, the rapture is a described as a um, catching away rather than a gathering. Right. Yes, that's interesting. Interesting. And in that respect, you're looking at two different applications of of activity. Of course, yes. A gathering and a catching away is not necessarily the same thing. Right, right. Because the gathering in Ephesians, the first chapter, brings together things in heaven and things on earth in unity. The catching away is taking things off the earth into heaven. Right, right, right. So you're getting different directions if you look at the scripture. We so can't the gathering is not a scattering. It's not your 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 stationary. Right. Yes. And the and the catching right. away is. You so it's the, it's the opposite of a scattering. Having been scattered, now he's bringing them back together. Yes. Before we you know, consider the yes. catching away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Matthew 24, verse 46 to 47. Blessed is that servant. Whom is Lord, when he comes, shall find so doing, feeding the Lord's sheep. Meat and due season. Yes. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. When his Lord cometh, when his Lord cometh, that individual that is found feeding his sheep, meat and due season, is going to be given a reward in a position pers perspective, assigned a position perspective, which is different from being glorified. Glorified is a state of existence. Position is a, a sign of um, a continuing <coughs> authority to exercise in a particular respective relation. Now, you've previously used the term inheritance. 
to refer to the Protopicus and whoever else may be you know, born again um, going into their communities. Mm -hmm. We understand that the reward that you're referring to right now, of course, is for those who we elevated the, uh, the teachers, the stars. And I wanted to ask, the stars are the first to get a reward. I know that they will get another reward, but they're the first to get a reward. Should we look at it as those who are elders start their rewards at the receipt of being sent to the communities? Or should we say that their rewards start only at the rapture? Only at the rapture. So how do we describe being sent to the communities as an inheritance? Well, let's first look at the gathering. Okay. Notice what he says. <clears throat> let's start in verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household? So you have two groups. You have the servants, you have the household. The servants are ruling over the household by giving them meat in due season. <clears throat> Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, he shall make him ruler over all his goods. Well, what happens to the household? It doesn't say anything. No. It's only pertaining to <coughs> the, the, the wise servant. Okay. So the wise servant is going to be moved into a high position. Right. The household is still there. Okay. So therefore we understand that even though the household going into their communities is an inheritance, it's not expressly described that way until the rapture. Yes, the inheritance, the inheritance here <clears throat> basically is the same concept as what you have in the promised land. When you get to the promised land, every tribe has an inheritance, a place allocated for them. The place allocated for Judah is not the same place that's allocated for Reuben right. or Lev Levi, who is of course throughout all the, the allocations, or Simeon, <coughs> or Gad, or Naphtali. Everybody has his own place. What is his own place? His inheritance, mm -hmm. as according to his covenant. They are in a covenant relationship <coughs> as sons of Jacob who received the inheritance from YHVH through Abraham. So it falls down and it coalesces in Abraham's descendants. And in that respect, the inheritance is just the beginning. That's not the fullness sure, of the inheritance. Sure. That's where they work out their <coughs> destiny preparing them for what they have been called to do. They have inherited this place in which nobody can, can interfere okay. with their progress in uh, being prepared for what God has called right. them to do. Plus, I remember that. <coughs> Since there will be some who, whilst in the communities, don't actually make it, you couldn't say that you know, they've already received their inheritance at sure. that point. Yeah. Sure, sure. <coughs> but let's go on. Scripture teaches there in the communities the saints will, pre will prepare for their positions as elders in the Father's kingdom. <coughs> Teachings which had never been carried out by the former leadership. Acts the 20th chapter verse 27 to 30 Former leadership never carried out the mandate that it was given. Hmm. I've heard cries of it's not their fault they didn't know. <laughs> yeah, but that's going to wash No, I don't think so. Acts 20, starting in 27, we're going to read down to verse 30. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. So Paul is saying, you do what I've done. 
you declare unto them all the counsel of God as I've declared it unto you. Take heed, therefore, so it's a warning to the elders, unto yourselves and unto all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, <coughs> rulers, to feed God's sheep. To feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Every single individual has got this man. If they step into that position of a calling, they are obliged, commanded, mm -hmm. to feed the flock all the counsel of God. You hold nothing back. That is prime. Yes. It's interesting that that even has to be said. Sure. Mr. Jones, I mean, we're looking for a set of ears to fill up. These are being told, okay, because you've received, now you must go out and give, like, of, of course, you know, why would, I mean, that would be the first co first thing I would want to do is tell somebody else. But that's, that's who I am. But Has it been done? Has not been done. Let's go on. <clears throat> Let's go to Jeremiah 23 verses 3 to 4. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them and will bring them again to their folds. And they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them. Unlike the pastors that destroyed and scattered the sheep of his pasture. These will feed his sheep. They shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Neither shall they, in other words, they are going to have the fullness of the whole counsel of God, everything they need to know. <clears throat> the body of Christ has never received the mandate of Christ. Because the leadership has never undertaken to fulfill the Great Commission. So when the church leaders of organized religion hear that they are to give the full counsel of, uh, of God, what do they understand that to mean? Salvation message. Come on. That's all you got. That's what the seminaries teach. You're right. You're right. They can't possibly think anything else. Which makes us in the next principle. <coughs> Scripture indicates... There they will be taught the hidden, hidden knowledge reserved for God's sons, but never pursued, never pursued, never pursued by church leadership. Matthew 13, verse 11. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but unto them it is not given. Matthew 28, verses 19 to 20. Go ye therefore and teach, teach all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. They'd done the latter, they didn't do the former. They baptized, but they never taught the whole counsel of God. Teaching, teaching, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Now the word command in the Greek comes from a Greek term in telemai, which means giving you charge. Teach them everything that I have charged you to teach them. Hold nothing back. And Lord, I'm with you always unto the end of the world. Hasn't been done. Verses in the next principle. In the communities, Scripture indicates only those who have kept what the Lord has given them will make the rapture. There, in the church communities, we just read it, Jeremiah 23, they're going to receive the whole counsel of God. And only those that keep put the whole counsel of God into operation are going to make the rapture. Turn to Revelation 3, verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, word logos of my patience. In other words, patiently kept my word. What word? The whole counsel of God, the great commission. Everything he has given to be taught, they have received and kept it. This is not talking about because you've been good, because you've read the Bible, because of he says you've kept the word that you have been given. Yeah. Because of that, I will also keep thee, the word keep there is ek, keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. They have kept the whole counsel of God. Now, Going to take a look at some of the things the Bible talks about. That not only haven't they been taught, they haven't even been understood. They haven't been endeavored to receive, let's pass along, but it's part of the Great Commission. Paul spends a lot of time encouraging the saints to follow these things. Scripture indicates through their ascended teachers, the angels, the church communities will be prepared for life in the heavens. That's the purpose of the gathering. So they'll understand what is waiting for them in eternity. That's the purpose of the church to begin with, not for life on earth. This is all things are new. Well, what all things? Got to be shown. And when you're shown, then you can be prepared to enter into the things that are waiting for you. Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm thinking, and I'm, as you're speaking, and so maybe you've already made it very clear, but you just now said that we are going to, giving the whole counsel of God to, to our students, and you spoke about things in heaven, okay? But it's not only heaven, it's heaven and earth. Or is it only heaven? Well, they're on earth preparing for heaven. Remember Colossians. The earth is not part of the covenant to begin with. See those things which are above, not on the earth. Well, what is the leadership of the church? We just left them prepared for life on earth. Which Paul says, if in this life only you have hope in Christ Jesus, you have all men most miserable. They have not taught the church to get off the earth. Right. That's the purpose of the gathering. Amen. Amen. Let's go on. 
Scripture indicates through their ascended teachers, the angels, the church communities will be prepared for life in the heavens. 1 Corinthians 2nd chapter, verse 9 to 10. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things, the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. For God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Who teaches this? So you ask the average person, what do you gain from this scripture? You're getting met with a blank stare. Yeah. So should we understand that it starts with but I has uh, I but I has not seen nor ear nor ear heard, referring to the fact that these things can only be heard through the spirit. Yes, turn to Ephesians, first chapter, verses eighteen to twenty. This is why the the, the teachers are elevated to angelic status, mm. so they can take the things of heaven present them to those that are on earth in a way in which they can, can comprehend it and be prepared. So should we understand that prior to the beginning of sorrows, no one, apart from the teachers of course, because you've got to prepare the teachers before they can start the beginning of sorrows, nobody could hear or see anything. No. How could they? Uh, it hasn't been these people don't have a clue. Sure. They don't have an understanding. Sure. They never pursued it. If you ask them, just ask them, right. what do you think of this? You get such a vague, nebulous, it's like he asks his pastor, what do we inherit in, in, in Christ? Oh, everything that Christ inherits. They don't know. Ephesians, the first chapter. It's not so bad they don't know, but they have been delegated to pursue and to teach. Mm. That's what the heck they're there for. To know. I think God that stands out of time and space and spans eternity is totally concerned with life on this little dust ball that this is sent his son to die so that we can comprehend baptism uh, uh, whether we um, are supposed to um, be baptized in your church's tank right. or over in the river here. Right. That's, that's what it's all about. What an insult to the Father. Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 18 to 23. This is the first thing that the teacher will present to the students. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word, who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him in his own right hand in the heavens. We have become new creatures. We don't function from an Adamic perspective. But nobody, well, I won't say nobody, very few have a comprehension that they identify with the new creation because they are not encouraged to do it. They're not encouraged to identify in that respect. They're encouraged to look at the old human perspective and perfect that, which God says, don't even consider it, it's dead. Don't waste your time with it. Resurrecting, trying to pump life into a corpse. I have a new life, an eternal life, with new abilities that are designed for you in the heavens, not on earth. It's not taught. It will be taught in the communities. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> so, they're going to comprehend that they have to have their understanding and like, this is the first principle that you teach the prototokos 
after you teach him the born again experience. You must be born again. And then when you're born again, you're a new creation, adapted for life in heaven. Then you must proceed to receive the spirit of understanding so you can prepare yourself for what lies ahead. Sequential instruction, which the prototokers will pick up just like yeah, that. Yeah. Then you're going to teach them, oh, there's so much about their counterparts. Ephesians 2nd chapter, verse 4 to 7. For God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace, his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. The giving of understanding that they identify us. He uses the word us, not them and us, us. In other words, in other words we are an extension of the counterpart that is in heaven. Okay. So, at some point, we are also going to be talking about multidimensional existence. Sure. Okay. How are we going to separate the counterpart from the multidimensional existence? Well, that all comes through the spirit comprehension. But you have to start on a, a level of linear experience so that they can enter into plurality. As they comprehend the counterpart, understanding of plurality comes with that. It's automatic. And in that respect, they identify with the counterpart, and the counterpart identifies with them. Turn to Revelation, 22nd chapter, verse 8. And I, John, saw these things and heard them, and when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. And saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I, I, who is he identifying with? I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren the prophets. He's identifying with his counterpart on earth. The counterpart is identifying with his counterpart in heaven. Because they are the same. One is just an extension. Jesus told Nicodemus, the Son of Man, which is in heaven. He identified as the counterpart. <clears throat> and in that respect, you gain a comprehension identity from an eternal perspective of yourself as a son. You're not limited by time and space and the human. You realize that you are a you are being injected into the human periphery, the human reality for time and for purpose, to qualify for the authority to rule and reign as sons with the elder brother. That's going to be taught in the communities. <laughs> God, what, what sense does it make for the Lord to come and take people back to heaven who are totally ignorant of Everything. How are you going to use them? How are you going to qualify? It's it's a waste of time. When Christians are dying today, do you think that they're hitting the ground running when they get to heaven? No. What are they doing? The same thing turned to Revelation, the seventh chapter. Verse uh, 15 to 17. 15 to 17.
Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. They have to take a, they have to have a period of adjustment. Mm -hmm. the, the sun will feed them. They should have been fed on earth. Okay. So that's what you mean by they won't uh, hit the ground running once they hit the heavens. No, I don't have a clue as to what's going on. Well, they enter into their inheritance, but they've got to be acclimated to life in heaven. Understand through the Holy Spirit what's going on. Ultimately, what their place would be that they didn't qualify for to begin with because they didn't know what they were pursuing. So, do we know whether this specific group, this specific group, are elders or peoples of the saints? Uh, these are, no, they're definitely not elders. Okay. They are best, 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 you can say is they are saints of a temporal calling mm. who so, got martyred in the tribulation period. So they would be priests? Yeah, we're all going to be priests. Of a temporal priest. calling, okay. Yes. But you wouldn't call them the peoples of the saint? No. They're higher than that? Yes, they're higher than that. Okay. People of the saints basically are uh, not going to come into their own until the Lord returns. Okay. No, these are saints that missed the rapture. It says they've washed their robes mm -hmm. and made them white. They are Christians with the temple calling, and they have uh, understanding of uh, what's happening. They got to be acclimated to life in heaven, because they go into eternity, earth centered. The reason they go to heaven is because they have the spirit in them which they, through commitment, finally allowed to fill them and make them pure. They wash their robes. But the commitment is what cost them their lives. So they're fit for heaven, but they're not fit for a place in heaven. They, they're at the altar because the Father immediately puts them doing a particular thing. Right. Well, if you take a look, it says what he's got to do to them. He's got to minister to them. Wipe away their tears. Uh, feed them, do these things so that they can be acclimated to life in heaven. That, that, what you see here, except for the martyrdom, mm -hmm. is the way the average Christian enters into eternity. They're not prepared for anything. They're prepared for life on earth. That's why a lot of people are going to have to do, have to answer for a lot of stuff. Yeah. Now, Scripture indicates they will be taught to understand their positions that await them. Revelation 2, verse 26 to 27. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as a vessel of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. Rulership over the nations. Well, if you take a look at just the songs of the committed saints, bless their hearts, who died. You look at, we used to sing these, these songs, and we still sing some of them. In church, um, oh, one is uh, talking about um, uh, what is it? We'll sit down by the river, and old sayings will renew. Uh, meet me in the morning is the name of it. Meet me in the morning by the bright river side. We'll sit down by the river, and. <clears throat> Fellowship, we will uh, abide. You'll know me in the morning by the smiles that I wear. When I meet you in the morning in the city built for a square. That's all they know. We're going to sit down by the river, talk about how we overcame. 
and uh, pray, be praising the Lord, and have a clue. Bless their hearts. They, they were committed, but they were never fed. They never an understanding of what, what it was. They still don't. Hmm. Revelation 3, verse 12. We'll be closing with this. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. I write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down from heaven, out of heaven, from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. <coughs> Pillar angels. Mm -hmm. Temple angels. Uh, the angels that pour out the wrath. They think these are angels. They don't know that they're saints. They don't have a clue. They're not taught. This will be taught in the communities by you whole council of God.